entirely by the machine in one day. The reason that uh, people are interested in automating construction is that it really brings a lot of benefits. Uh, for example, construction is pretty labor intensive and uh, although it provides job for uh, the sector of the society, it also has issues uh, and uh, complications. For example, construction is the most dangerous job that there is. Uh, it is worse than mining and agriculture. It has got the highest level of fatality almost in every country. Another issue is the waste. Um, an average home in the United States has three to seven tons of waste. Uh, so this is huge uh, if we look at the impact of construction and, and knowing that about 40% of all materials in the world are used in construction. So a big waste of uh, energy and resources and big damage to the environment as well. Making homes using hammers and nails and wood with the state of our technology today is really absurd and will go the way of our labor class in regards to manufacturing in the United States. Recently there was a study by economist David Attor of MIT that states that our middle class is obsolete and being replaced by automation. Quite simply, mechanization is more productive, efficient, and sustainable than human labor in virtually every sector of the economy today. Machines do not need vacations, breaks, insurance, pensions, and they can work 24 hours a day every day. The output potential and accuracy compared to human labor is unmatched. The bottom line, repetitive human labor is becoming obsolete and impractical across the world. And the unemployment you see around you today is fundamentally the result of this evolution of efficiency in technology. For years, market economists have dismissed this growing pattern, which could be called technological unemployment, because of the fact that new sectors always seem to emerge to reabsorb the displaced workers. Today, the service sector is the only real hub left and currently employs over 80% of the American workforce, with most industrialized countries maintaining a similar proportion. However, this sector is now being challenged increasingly by automated kiosks, automated restaurants, and even automated stores. Economists today are finally acknowledging what they have been denying for years. Not only is technological unemployment exasperating the current labor crisis we see across the world due to the global economic downturn, but the more the recession deepens, the faster the industries are mechanizing. The catch, which is not realized, is that the faster they mechanize to save money, the more they displace people, the more they reduce public purchasing power. This means that while the corporation can produce everything more cheaply, fewer and fewer people will actually have money to buy anything, regardless of how cheap they become. The bottom line is that the labor for income game is slowly coming to an end. In fact, if you take a moment to reflect on the jobs which are in existence today, which automation could take over right now if applied, 75% of the global workforce could be replaced by mechanization tomorrow. And this is why, in a resource-based economy, there is no monetary market system. No money at all. For there is no need. A resource-based economy recognizes the efficiency of mechanization and accepts it for what it offers. It doesn't fight it like we do today. Why? Because it is irresponsible not to, given any interest in efficiency and sustainability. And this brings us back to our city system. In the center is the central dome, which not only houses the educational facilities and transportation hub, it also hosts the mainframe that runs the city's technical operations. The city is, in fact, one big automated machine. It has sensors and all technical belts to track the progress of agriculture, energy gathering, production, distribution, and the like. Now, would people be needed to oversee these operations in the event of a malfunction or the like? Most probably yes, but that number would decrease over time as improvements continue. However, as of today, maybe 3% of the city population would be needed for this job when you break it down. And I can assure you, 
that in an economic system which is actually designed to take care of you and secure your well-being without you having to submit to a private dictatorship on a daily basis, usually to a job that is either technically unnecessary or socially pointless, while often struggling with debt that doesn't exist just to make ends meet. I guarantee you people will volunteer their time left and right to maintain and improve a system that actually takes care of them. And coupled with this issue of incentive comes the common assumption that if there isn't some external pressure for one to work for a living, people will just sit around, do nothing, and turn into fat, lazy blobs. This is nonsense. The labor system we have today is in fact the generator of laziness, not a resolver of it. If you think back to when you were a child, full of life, interested in new things to understand, likely creating and exploring, but as time went on, the system pushed you into the focus of figuring out how to make money. And from early education to study at a university, you are narrowed, only to emerge as a creature which serves as a cog in a wheel in a model that sends all the fruits to the upper 1%. Scientific studies have now shown that people are, in fact, not motivated by monetary reward when it comes to ingenuity and creation. The creation itself is the reward. Money, in fact, appears only to serve as an incentive for repetitive, mundane actions, a role we have just now shown can be replaced by machine. So when it comes to innovation, the actual use of the human mind, the monetary incentive has proven to be a hindrance interfering and detracting from creative thought. And this might explain why Nikola Tesla, the Wright brothers, and other inventors who contributed massively to our current world never showed a monetary incentive to do so. Money is, in fact, a false incentive and causes a hundred times more distortion than it does contribution. Good morning, class. Please settle down. The first thing I would like to do is go around the room and ask what everyone would like to be when they grow up. Who would like to go first? Okay, how about you, Sarah? When I grow up, I want to work at McDonald's like my mom. Oh, family tradition, eh? How about you, Linda? When I grow up, I'm going to be a prostitute on the streets of New York City. Oh, glamour girl, huh? Very ambitious. How about you, Tommy? When I grow up, I'm going to be a rich, elitist businessman who works on Wall Street and profits off of the collapse of foreign economies. Enterprising. And great to see some multicultural interest. As stated before, a resource-based economy applies the scientific method to social concern. And this isn't limited to simply technical efficiency. It also has the consideration of human and social well-being directly and what comprises it. What good is a social system if, in the end, it doesn't produce happiness and peaceful coexistence? So it is important to point out that with the removal of the money system and the necessities of life provided, we would see a global reduction in crime by about 95% almost immediately, for there is nothing to steal, embezzle, scam, or the like. 95% of all people in prisons today are there due to some monetary-related crime or drug abuse, and drug abuse is a disorder, not a crime. So what about the other 5%, the truly violent, often seeming to some as being violent for the sake of being violent? Are they just evil people? The, the reason that I, frankly, think it's a waste of time to engage in moral value judgments about uh, people's violence is because it doesn't advance by one iota our understanding of either the causes or the prevention of the violent behavior. People sometimes ask if I believe in forgiving criminals. My answer to that is, no, I don't believe in forgiveness any more than I believe in condemnation. It's only if we as a society can take the same attitude of treating violence as a problem in public health and preventive medicine rather than as a moral evil 
Uh, it's only when we make that change in our own attitudes and assumptions and values that we will actually succeed in reducing the level of violence rather than stimulating it, which is what we do now. The more justice you seek, the more hurt you become, because there's no thing as justice. There is whatever there is out there. That's it. In other words, if people are conditioned to be racist and bigots, if they're brought up in an environment that advocates that, why do you blame the person for it? They're a victim of a subculture. Therefore, they have to be helped. The point is, we have to redesign the environment that produces aberrant behavior. That's the problem, not putting a person in jail. That's why judges, lawyers, freedom of choice, such concepts are dangerous because it gives you misinformation that the person is bad or that person is a serial killer. Serial killers are made just like soldiers become serial killers with a machine gun. They become killing machines, but nobody looks at them as murderers or assassins because that's natural. So we blame people. We say, well, this guy was a Nazi. He tortured Jews. No, he was brought up to torture Jews. Once you accept the fact that people have individual choices and they're free to make those choices, free to make choices means without being influenced. And I can't understand that at all. All of us are influenced in all our choices by the culture we live in, by our parents and by the values that dominate. So we're influenced. So there can't be free choices. What's the greatest country in the world? The true answer, I haven't been all over the world, and I don't know, know enough about different cultures to answer that question. I don't know anybody that speaks that way. They say, it's good old USA, it's the greatest country in the world. There's no survey. Have you been to India? No. Have you been to England? No. Have you been to France? No. Uh, what do you make your assumptions on? They can't answer. They get mad at you. They say, well, God damn it, who the hell are you to tell me what to think? You know. Don't forget, you're dealing with aberrated people. They're not responsible for their answers. They're victims of culture. That means they've been influenced by their culture. When we consider a resource-based economy, there are often a number of arguments that tend to come up with regard hey, to the efficiency. Hey, uh, hey, uh, now hold on just a minute. Yes. I know what this is. This is called Marxism, buddy. Stalin killed 800 billion people because of ideas like this. My father died idea. in this the right. gulag. Oh, hold on, this hold on. Communist, fascist. You don't like this America, you should just leave. Right, everybody you know just calm down. Death to the new world order. Death to the new world order. And as the irrationality of the audience grew, shocked and confused, suddenly the narrator suffered a fatal heart attack. <laughs> and the seemingly communist propaganda film was no more. You know, I've said that sort of thing to people in think tank type of situations and, uh, you know, these Club of Rome types and so forth. Marxist. What Marxist? Where did that come from? You know, they just, they got this icon they hold on to. It's their holy grail. Uh, and it's such an easy one, you know. People ask if I'm a socialist or a communist or a capitalist, and I say, I'm none of the above, and why do you, th why do you think that those are the only options? All of those political constructs were created by writers who assumed that we lived on a planet of infinite resources. Not a one of those political philosophies even con contemplates that there might be a shortage of anything. I believe that communism, socialism, free enterprise, fascism are part of social evolution. That you can't take a giant step from one culture to another 
but they're in between systems. Before there's any ism, we've got a life ground, and the life ground is, as I just described most easily, it's all the conditions required to take your next breath, and that involves the air you breathe, the water you get, the safety you have, the education you can access, all these things that we 